Greetings, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today we're going to be uh, exploring a vital subject which I hold very important as to how we view Scripture. Our understanding is based on our perspective and our perspective of things when we begin to look and examine. I understand that many of us come from different academic backgrounds, and we're going to take that into consideration. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to present to you today the importance of choosing between two views of interpretation when we're looking at Scripture. And by all means, I encourage you to consider both. But at one point or another in your examination, and I do emphasize prayer, that uh, once we're born again of the Spirit, which we are transformed to become new creatures in Christ, as Paul said, now we are sons of God. That we are transformed creatures. We have went through a transformation. We are no longer who we were or what we were, but a new creature in Christ. And what we're going to be talking about today will help you to divide and understand by interpretation some of the things that perhaps eluded your understanding in the Bible before. And I emphasize again how important understanding is. We're going to be talking today about two views of the word in the Old Testament where we're going to begin our examination. We're going to separate between two views. One is the angel view. The angel view, uh, by definition, is the literal view of the scriptures taken in their meaning as they are worded uh, in exactness, meaning exactly what they're saying in the simplest of interpretation. Uh, and I'm going to explain how that differs from a later design of view which came into uh, invention uh, in around 200 AD and be became accepted by the Catholic Church around the 500s and has stayed in the academic somehow with the uh, trans uh, Reformation and the Protestant movements down through the, <clears throat> the centuries and is still prevalent, unfortunately. Uh, as a format in teaching, and it's we'll just summarize it first off by calling it the Lines of Seth view, otherwise known as the Sethite view. And in theological studies, uh, historically, it would be the Africanus view. First off, who was Africanus? His name was uh, Sextus Julius Africanus. Africanus was a Catholic monk between the years of 200 A.D. to 270 A.D. And during his time, uh, he formulated a doctrine of invention by outline where he did a series of what he would call conceptual studies and taking different scriptures from different places in the Bible he mapped out and form, formulated what has come to be known today as the Lines of Seth view. Now, this became broadly accepted and in fact was accepted uh, as doctrine in the Catholic Church post-500 AD and be, became their standard teaching of view. Now, we do not, at Central Church, first off, let me say this. We do not call interpretation view doctrine. Now, let, let me explain what I mean by that. The Bible says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Now, what that means is, is that we build doctrine based upon scripture. Now, how we build doctrine whether or not it is truth and accurate, first off, depends on it being within context 
of the literal text. Now, myself and many others could take diversification of context from the scriptures and we could build a structure of framework to just about build an idea of anything we want to propose and, and there are some who would just accept it based on the fact that it was structured well and that we referenced this scripture we referenced that scripture and we built them in a way as to where that they, they arrived at an end result of bringing out something that we had preconceived that we wanted to prove by position. Well, we're not here today to prove a position or to defend a position. We're here to make important clarifications and give you the reasons why at Central Church, as the pastor, I have chosen to teach from the angel view, mainly because it is the view I have come to accept as being accurate. Now, are they those that I respect as men of God who have not come to this? Yes. There are great men of God out there teaching who have not come to arrive at the angel view of interpretation. I have been taught by many who were schooled in the Africanus lines of Seth, Sethite view. And for many, many years I struggled because of the fact that I just did not agree with it, but yet had not arrived at the place in my understanding to where that I recognized it as being false teaching. Now, where is it false teaching? It is false teaching when you platform something as doctrine that is not intended to be doctrine, that is built upon a structure such as what I spoke of by invention, to defend a position which is not literal in Scripture. And quite frankly, the Sethite view is unbiblical. Uh, Africanus, when he invented this outline to build a doctrine, went out of context and, and drew from sources of Scripture out of context and arranged them in a systematic way, just to defend a position that he was wanting to take because the Catholic Church, frankly, was uncomfortable with uh, certain of the literature of antiquities, which uh, landscaped some of the understandings of the Bible, which, uh, frankly, were in contradiction to the Africanist invention. Now, let's move a little bit on from technical here now. Let's get down to plain talk. Uh, the first place that we will arrive at in, in Scripture, in the writings of Moses, where how we interpret this really comes into play, and why you must take at least a literal examination to, to understand what's being said, is uh, in Genesis chapter 6. Now understand, in a lot of the courses of Genesis... Moses wrote things very simply. He didn't give a lot of explanation for simple details, which he laid out as facts of information. And by faith, we take those facts of information as being absolute and as being inspired by God. In Genesis chapter 6, we are told that it came to pass when the men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, just saying simply there that as men began to multiply, of course, there were daughters born to them. That the sons of God, the Hebrew wording there is Benah Ha Elohim, saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, in other words, attractive, pleasant to look upon, in modern street talk, good looking. And they took them wives of all which they chose. In other words, they just picked some out and took them. Did they court them? It doesn't say. Did they just abduct them, kidnap them? It doesn't say. It just they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, first off, there are many good teachers out there who have some very lengthy outlines and exposés concerning the Benah Elohim. 
So if you'll allow me to be a little bit simple and break it down here for you, there are those such as uh, Minister Fortson, who has done exhaustive uh, online writings concerning the difference between Angel View and the Africanist view, the lines of Seth view. Also, uh, even though I take different positions on different things than he does, Dr. Charles Missler has some excellent online uh, lectures on YouTube where he also discusses the Benaiha Elohim, uh, Elohim and does a great job and also takes the angel view where, wherein I do agree with him. Uh, another one I will re uh, recommend uh, highly simply because of his great expertise into the ancient Hebrew and classical Hebrew languages and their meanings and his special studies in the subject of uh, the Elohim of ancient and classical Hebrew would be Dr. Michael S. Heiser, Heisner. Uh, Michael S. Heiser. And he has several YouTubes that are available. I do not agree with Dr. Heiser uh, in my interpretation of certain doctrinal positions. But I cannot deny his expertise. And as a resource, he has some very good research into the exact meanings of certain words, such as the use of the word Elohim, where we simply put it as God in the English translation. Now getting to uh, the importance of taking one position or the other. I'm, I can't tell you which position to take. You have to weigh all that before the Lord in prayer and study. But I'm going to explain to you why I believe it is important that we come to the place where we accept the angel view of interpretation. Because if you take the lines of Seth view, the Africanus view, invention of Sextus Julius Africanus, then you will not understand certain things about prophecy the way they are worded literally. Because you will have to adjust your interpretation to your interpretation based on the invention of Africanus. And once you really take a look at the two, you, you'll understand why I say that. Let's look at the literal view a little bit, the angel view, which up until the time of Africanus, the only scriptural thing that the church had, what we'll call the early churches. Now, there were many churches within the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the New Testament. We know at the time of the writing of the book of Revelations, for instance, that there were seven recognized major churches in what was called Asia. So there were some differences in character and in the doctrinal understandings of these seven churches already at that time, which is just a short time after the uh, resurrection and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. But when we look back in antiquities at reading, uh, coming to a consensus, reading in Genesis, where in chapter 6 is talking about the sons of God taking daughters of men. There definitely is a differentiation made there between men and sons of God. There's some difference between sons of God and men. And Africanus did a lot of work in his uh structure of invention to try to explain away that this was an exo influence meaning extraterrestrial or exo dimensional or transdimensional influence or exo bio influence and because so many were uncomfortable with that kind of thinking and the catholic church didn't want that to have to deal with this kind of thinking so they just simply did away with it and actually locked away certain books which contained information in the landscape literature that would support understandings of this meaning. So that being said, let me point out to you that it's not saying angels here. 
Now, I disagree, of course, with a couple of lecture presenters in the sense that they would de tell you this is definitely always going to be angels. No, I disagree. The heavenly host may consist of created beings. I mean, look around you here on earth. There's a lot of created beings that uh, may not have been what we would consider to be angels in the transdimensional thought. These, these could have actually been sons of God who were biological beings. Uh, now, I'm saying they could be. I'm not saying they had to be, okay? There's a difference. We're not building a doctrine here. We're building a view or examining a view. Now, in taking that into consideration, let's look at who these particular binah Elohim may have been. Now, how do we do that? First off, we look at all of our resources of information available to us. First and foremost, our canon, the Holy Bible. What does it have to say? Then, we go from the Holy Bible and we look and see, do we have any other historical resources that might shed better light uh, in the broader landscape that we might just get a picture of the times? And in so doing, we would have to go to some of the other antiquities for information, such as the Book of Enoch. And the Book of Enoch now, since the discoveries of the Dead Sea Scroll findings of fragments there also, has been made more legitimate as an actual historical account of antiquities in literature. Is it inspired scripture? I wouldn't go so far as to say that. Is parts of it inspired? Yes, I would say they are. Can you have parts inspired and other parts not? Yes, due to corruption. How does corruption occur? Corruption occurs through a lack of translation and a lack of accurate copy and, and the act of human intervention in the writing, such as is the history of many churches. Uh, there's many church organizations in the world today that change the scripture to make it fit better their position. So that, that historically does occur. It does happen with some things. Uh, in looking at the Enoch account in literature, we find that these particular Binaha Elohim were identified as what is called watchers, the watchers. And we can take by examination and make a determination through reasoning what a watcher may have been. A watcher, first off, implies that they were sent to observe or to monitor, placed on station for some purpose. And we would have to do cross-reference, comparative theological studies, comparative historical studies, in order to determine what monitoring they may be doing, what was going on at this time. Is it still going on? And then that opens up uh, new windows of examination. But we know that this is in the early parts of Genesis, and it's so early that it says, as men begin to multiply on the earth, it gives us a time setting. So we can go from there and realize we're not very far away from the story of Adam and Eve and in the garden situation. So it is very much a possibility that as the Lord includes us in the things that he does, that he could do everything without us. The Lord doesn't really need us. The Lord accommodates us, and he allows us to participate in the important things that he does with his creation. Important point. The only reason you're a witness and a minister today and not already called on up and already taken on to be with the Lord in heaven is because he is allowing you to be a participant. It's important that we understand that. We are participants in the kingdom of God. We are a part of, we today are transformed to become new creatures. So we're participants in the work that the Lord is doing here on earth. We have a role. Likewise, in literature, I see that the watchers had a likewise role, whatever it may have been. These watchers were not of the children of men. No, they were not, obviously, because the literal wording of Genesis chapter 6 precludes that they were not by saying that they looked upon the daughters of men. 
Africanus did a lot of work to try to explain that away and do away with that definition. But I can tell you simply and literally that is the definition. And I want to go on and I'm going to end part one here pretty quick because it's getting quite lengthy. And we'll go to a part two of, and we'll call it why angel view, not Africanus. And when we go to part two, we'll get a little bit more explanation there. I've opened the door for you to begin to think, weigh, and pray these things. I believe it's important that you take the correct view. Does it mean you have to change any of your basic core doctrines about salvation, about your monotheo or polytheo? Uh, it will imply that, that those things will be examined in a different view. But no, it doesn't mean you have to change any of your core beliefs about salvation. But it will have an effect upon how you view and how you understand prophecy and the end times. And how you view what was going on at the times of Noah and before and shortly after. And it will also change your view as to how we relate to and the dominion structure. The dominion structure of how God structured our realm of reality with regard to relationship with the exo realities. And we'll explain more about exo realities. Uh, in science, dimensional studies would be an accurate uh, parable of example of what exo realities are. Uh, in theology, exo realities uh, take us into a level of what separates us in dominion from the angelic realm, from the theocratic structure of the composition of the levels of reality and all these things and without having to get into all that our examination of angel view will open a window of examination that before may have been completely closed by to you and maybe it wasn't by choice we have several uh in fact I, at times they seem like a majority of dictatorial pastors who because of the fact that they don't want to go to a certain place of conversation, or perhaps they are insecure in their ability to deal with certain places of conversation, that will just say, I just, I, we don't talk about that, or, or we don't go there. Well, I'm not one of those. I do go there, and we do talk about it. We're going to go into places of examination under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Ghost, and we're going to talk about some things that others will just slam the door shut and say, we're not going there. That's a scary place. We're not going to look at that. Well, first off, we have no fear. Perfect love casteth out all fear. And we love truth. So we're going to go to some of these places, and we're going to take a look. We're going to talk about who the watchers may have been. What actually happened? What was the result? And what did God do about it? Where did others other than man disobey God? Where is it recorded? What does it have to say about it? And what was the iniquities and the abominations that resulted? You're going to find some interesting things. It's going to be a, a fascinating and adventurous study. This is Pastor Alan Childs. And I'm inviting you to join me again and come back with me for part two. But in between now and then, I want you to do a little looking, a little studying on your own, and study out the angel view and contrast it with the Africanus, Julius, uh, Sextus Julius Africanus was the inventor. Uh, you can look it up under that title on your research, research studies on your search engines online. And you can find uh, more information than you'll find in your local library. Um, so just add your online studies to your list of resources. We want to invite you to take a look uh, below this window for this video into our caption screen below in the block. And invite you to join us and become a part of our growing network of home churches and home Bible study groups which we will be glad to be a help to you in that. Uh, we also have resources for future licensing situations for those who feel that they are called to minister, and we want to be a support and a help to that. 
And we want to do this in a way that is under the authority and in submission to the Holy Ghost. We want to emphasize greatly that that's our starting place, that we must repent. We must recognize our sinful state here. That we must move forward in our repentant walk of faith and come to a place of obedience. Be baptized in the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, fulfilling our part of the covenant which he has already signed in his own blood. That contract of salvation he's already signed his part. His part is done. His work is done there. Now it's up to you to sign your part by taking on his name in baptism. And once you have done that, his word promises you in Acts 2 and 38 that you shall, not maybe, not might, but that you shall receive the Holy Ghost. And we've got teachings about that, of course, in more great detail, of identifying what actually happens. In Jesus' name, I bid you farewell of part one as we transition and go to part two. When I post part two here in probably a week from now, I invite you to come back with me as we reexamine this. We welcome you to become a part of the Central Church based at Boundary County, Texas. This is Pastor Reverend Alan Childs. Farewell in Jesus' name. Have a great day.